On today's Winning Cures Everything, it is Bowl Previews Part Number 3. That's right. We go over the last 13 games of the season before we get to the National Championship game, of course. Uh, let's not waste time. Let's dive into it. Can you believe it? It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in. Winning Cures Everything. I am your host, Gary Seegers. Of course, you can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at GaryWCE. Or, of course... You can follow me on Twitter or X or whatever, at Winning Cures. Uh, I may have already said that. I don't know. I'm a little spacey today. It's the last day before the holiday. I'm recording this early because I have a ton of family obligations uh, before the holidays, or I guess over the holidays. So uh, I don't know when I'm going to get a chance to do this. So I was like, all right, we'll just go on and do it early. Um, we got a, a few games today. Of course, let me go on and tell you. Check out the Bet US College Football Show. I will be doing that one. Uh, so by the time you watch this, those will have already been done. So go back, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, and you can find deep dives from myself, Parker, and Kyle on all of the different games for this. So uh, with that said, uh, if you want to support the show, buymeacoffee.com slash winning cures, or you can become a member here. We're going to have a few more member-only things that pop up on the YouTube uh, as we go. Right. And so I would imagine that we'll we'll just figure it out. We'll just figure it out. So uh, the next year is going to be very interesting. I'm wanting to change up a few things and whatnot. You guys give me some ideas in the comments. Let me know what you want for the new year. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious. We're going to move back into, you know, a bit of a news cycle after the national championship game. Uh, but from then on, like, I'm sure we'll be talking about ACC realignment and all that kind of mess that Florida State is uh, is doing to us right now. We'll, we'll figure that stuff out as we go. Uh, but let's let's not waste a bunch of time. Let's get into the games. We're going to try and be quick about this. Okay, so let's go ahead and start off. Let's see. We'll start off here with the Gator Bowl. That's right. Uh, Clemson currently a five-point favorite over Kentucky in the Gator Bowl. Uh, Friday, December 29th at 11 a.m. Central Time on ESPN. That's... Uh, that's when you can find and where you can find that one. Uh, let's let's dive in. The total is 47 on this. So let's look at the numbers. Uh, over the last six weeks of the season, well, let's look at full season first. Clemson, minus 8.49 on that. Um, makes sense. I mean, their defense is just outstanding. Um, and Kentucky's offense has not been great all year, right? Uh, but when you look at what Clemson does on offense, I mean, it's, it's obviously not been good. Uh, so you see their, their rushing attack, not good against Kentucky's defense, which has actually been pretty good. Here's the thing. When you get to the last six weeks of the season and let's go on and toss it on there, Clemson minus 10.39. Uh, I know Clemson's got some dudes out, Bo Collins, et cetera. Uh, but I still think that their defense is going to be like really good. And Kentucky, not great at running the football, even though it appears Ray Davis is going to play in this game. Uh, again, Clemson, I think, is going to be able to run the ball. Um, obviously, we'll see. Kentucky's defense pretty decent at stopping the run. Uh, the issue, of course, that number 59 rushing success rate for Clemson, number 96 for Kentucky's defense over the last six weeks of the season. Uh, Clemson really good at not allowing uh, stuffs. Their stuff rate is number seven, Kentucky number 23. So Kentucky, pretty good. Um, standard down success rate. For Kentucky's defense, number 107 allowed, and Clemson's offense, number 48. So if Clemson can uh, can stay ahead of the chains, they should be in a pretty good spot here. Uh, so I, I look at this. I, I'm going to take Clemson, minus the five here. And again, these numbers may change because I'm recording early. Uh, but for the time that I'm recording this... Uh, Clemson, anything less than a touchdown is what I'm going to take. Uh, you get into that seven and a half range, eh, probably not going to touch that one. But uh, but I will take Clemson uh, in this one right now. So give me the Tigers minus the five on that one. 
we move on. The Sun Bowl. Notre Dame against Oregon State. Notre Dame currently a six and a half point favorite. Total is 41 and a half on this one. It's uh, December 29th, that Friday, 1 p.m. Central Time on CBS. One of the few non-ESPN bowl games. So let's uh, let's go on and pull up some numbers here. And I don't know why we would pull up these numbers because I, I think Notre Dame is going to have eight or nine guys out on their offense that are, you know, starters. Uh, Oregon State going to have a bunch of dudes out. Like, none of these numbers matter in the grand scheme of things, right? Uh, Notre Dame, full season, stats-wise, would be favored by uh, 11 and a half or so. But let's, you know, at, at the biggest thing, their offense, right? Well, you're not going to have Audric Estime. You're not going to have uh, Sam uh, Hartman. You're not going to, like, it, they've got both of their big-time offensive linemen are opting out of this game. It's it's just a mess. Uh, but the defense is really, really good, and they're still going to have some of those dudes playing on defense. So that's something to pay attention to. Um Notre Dame, just uh, significantly more talented, better, haven't been gutted by coaching change. Like, there's there's a ton of stuff there. Uh, you look over the last four weeks, and it's even more lopsided. It looks like Notre Dame minus 18.63 uh, because of that Oregon State defense, not very good at stopping the pass. Uh, but they are good at stopping the run, and Notre Dame likes to run the ball. It's, you know, more than 50% of the time they are running the ball. Uh, but again, you look at the defensive numbers for Notre Dame, and they have been outstanding over the last six weeks of the season. I just, I mean, I guess I'm going to take uh, Notre Dame at, at minus six and a half. I don't like the number, but uh, wh- what else can you do here? I mean, it, I just, it, none of it makes a whole lot of sense to me. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. I just, I, I think... I think Notre Dame is the significantly better team, uh, number nine in five factors plus talent rank. Uh, Oregon State is number 37 over the last six weeks of the season. This, I, how about this? Uh, the total on this is 41 and a half. I might even go lower than that because I just, I don't know where the points are going to come from. So, uh, so yeah, on, on this one, at, for show purposes, uh, give me Notre Dame minus the six and a half because I just don't see it from Oregon State. That's what I'll say. All right. Continuing on, the Liberty Bowl in Memphis gets to play a bowl game at home uh, against the same team that they played it against the last time they were in the Liberty Bowl, Iowa State. So Iowa State currently, uh, it looks like they are a 10-point favorite pretty much across the board right now. I mean, this number has just continued to climb, which uh, surprised me, but it is what it is. So 10-point favorite, total of 57.5. This one's uh, Friday, December 29th on uh, ESPN, 2.30 p.m. Central Time. And we'll pull that one up as well. Let's take a look at the number. Uh, Full season would have Memphis favored by 4.25. Remember, Iowa State did not look good to start out the year. And Memphis looked, uh, or sorry, Iowa State uh, did not look good. Memphis did look good, right, to start off the year. But if you look over the last six weeks... Well, now I've got, stats-wise, Iowa State favored by one point. Power rating would have Iowa State favored by eh, almost half a point. So Memphis has lost two starting offensive linemen. They lost their backup quarterback, etc. cetera. Uh, there could be some more guys that decide to opt out. This Memphis defense is really, really bad, right? Um, Iowa State does have two running backs, like backup running backs, that both had over 100 snaps this year. Uh, that are both in the portal, but I think they have found their starting running back, so is what it is. Uh, but the story here is Rocco Becht and, and what he's been doing throwing the football, uh, number 20 in passing success rate and number 8 in PPA per pass. Uh, here, let's pull, up the, uh, let's pull up the full page here so you can see. Uh, yeah, number 8 PPA per pass right there uh, against number 91 for Memphis' defense. Uh, number 20 in passing success rate, number 114 for Memphis's defense. Memphis's defense is not good at, at stopping the pass, just at all. Uh, and even worse than that, standard downs PPA, Memphis is number 118, standard down success, number 111. That would be an issue if it wasn't for the fact that Iowa State is number 115 on offense and standard down success. So uh, this is kind of a crapshoot. Like, who's going to be able to stay ahead of the chains? 
I, I expect Iowa State to be able to score points throwing the ball uh, because Memphis' defense is just not good. But on the other side, I kind of expect Memphis to be able to score because, my God, they've scored on everybody. Uh, Memphis' offense is number 17 in predicted points added per pass, and Iowa State's defense is number 85. Memphis' offense number three in the country over the last six weeks in passing success rate, and Iowa State's defense is number 100. So uh, both of these teams, I think, are going to be able to score. This certainly uh, lends itself to an over if you don't pay attention to the fact that Iowa State only runs Uh, what, 58 and a half plays per game, which is number 131 in the country out of 133 teams. Uh, But on the other side, Memphis can kind of push the pace a little bit because they are number 33 in offensive snaps per game. So they're going to want to kind of go up and down the field here. Um, 10 points is too many. Uh, Memphis at home, I I do think we're going to have a strong uh, contingent of Iowa State fans here. But uh, this 10 points, just too many. I expect this to be back and forth. I uh, would certainly look at an over of the 57 and a half, uh, probably anything other than 60 I would feel pretty good about. Uh, and granted, I'm recording this on Friday, December 22nd, so I don't know what the weather is going to be like, but uh, that's what I would look towards. And so for show purposes, I'm taking Memphis plus the 10, and I would certainly be looking at an over on that one. Next on the board, the Cotton Bowl. Missouri against Ohio State. And right now, Missouri, a one-point favorite. That one's come down a little bit because it had reached all the way up to two and a half. Never got to the three, uh, but it it did sit at two and a half for a bit. It's back down to one, but Missouri is still favored. A total of 49 on this. This one also Friday, December 29th at 7 p.m. Central Time on ESPN. And let's uh, let's go on and pull up numbers. That way you can see. I know Ohio State's going to have a bunch of opt-outs. I know Kyle McCord has already gone over to Syracuse. I know that they are going to have some guys that sit out. I would not expect Marvin Harrison to play in this game, etc. But full season numbers, I would have Ohio State favored by 17 points here. 17 points. Um, Over the last six weeks, it's even worse. I would have Ohio State minus 19. Uh, And that includes the toughest competition in the past six weeks. Uh... That Ohio State has played. Like, Ohio State's got a stronger uh, strength of schedule, number seven, than Missouri, number 33. This Missouri team, they what Eli Drinkwitz did was incredibly impressive. But are we positive that they are the only motivated team here? Like, I know that that's why the line moved the way that it did. Uh, But I don't think that there's going to be as many opt-outs as you would think. And the drop off from Kyle McCord to Devin Brown, I don't believe is that crazy. Uh, let's uh, let me pull up the full page so that you can see. Uh, I, look, Ohio State number twenty one in PPA per drive on offense. Missouri's defense is number sixty three. Uh, you start to look at, at PPA per play, the predicted points added per play. Ohio State's number fifteen. Missouri's defense is number eighty four. So number eighty four PPA per play, but number sixty three PPA per drive. Uh, kind of shows you about turnover margin and whatnot. Um, Missouri is number 48 in takeaways per game, so that's pretty good. Uh, but Ohio State, number 15 in giveaways per game. They just do not turn the ball over, but they also don't make you turn the ball over, right? Ohio State's defense, number 122 in takeaways per game. Uh, Missouri is number 8 in giveaways per game. So I wouldn't expect a ton of turnovers from either team in this one. Uh, Missouri's offense, number 19, PPA per drive. Uh, Ohio State's defense is number four. Like, Jim Knowles against Eli Drinkwitz with a month to prepare is just wild. Like, I, I think the depth for Ohio State is is just as good as who some of the guys for Missouri are, are that are actually starting. So, I just I don't understand the line movement. Um, when you start to look at, it, you know, what Ohio State does well, on offense and on defense, it kind of matches up with the strengths of Missouri. And when you start to look at five factors and stuff like that, like Ohio State, number four, Missouri, number 11, Missouri is incredibly well coached. But I think sometimes the narrative gets switched on Ohio State because of the fact that they lost to Michigan. Okay, they lost on the road at the number one team in the country. Like, that... 
and even if they're not technically the number one team or whatever, uh, per any kind of rating that you might have, they're still a top three team. So losing on the road in a one possession game when you were driving with a chance to win, yeah. But again, you lose your quarterback. I don't know that it's that big of a drop off. So I, I'm going to Ohio State here. Like this, this seems easy to me, and maybe I'm I'm just I'm going to go against. Uh, a lot of the other cappers that are that are thinking that motivation is the issue. Look, Ohio State has been in positions where they did not make the CFP before, and they always win those games, even with the backups. So, why would this be any different? Like now, you're playing a, a less talented team, I think, in Missouri than you have in some of those other spots. So, I'll take Ohio State plus the one. Um, anything under like two and a half. I would take Ohio State. Like it just it, this seems like the significantly better team even with the opt outs. So that's that's the direction I'm going there. The Peach Bowl in Atlanta, Ole Miss and Penn State. Penn State currently a four point favorite, total of forty eight and a half on this one. And uh, this one's on Saturday, December thirtieth at eleven AM Central Time on ESPN. And let's jump over to it. Let's look at some of the numbers. Full season, I would have Penn State favored by 10, which is kind of wild. Penn State, number one in defensive success rate allowed. Uh, Ole Miss, number 47 on offensive. Uh, as far as Penn State's offense, number 24. Um, Ole Miss's defense, number 62. You start to look at PPA per drive and stuff like that. Ole Miss is actually better at scoring points than they are at, at you know sustaining successful plays. Uh, number 26, PPA per drive. Uh, predicted points added per drive for Ole Miss. Um, but that Penn State defense is serious. But you start to look at the fact that, you know, Manny Diaz is gone now. Uh, I think they're still going to be really good on defense. But they've also got several guys that have opted out. Ole Miss, not so much. Uh, you know, they've got the the tackle that got injured in the Georgia game or before the Georgia game. Um, but he's, you know, he's not going to play in this, obviously. Uh, this line was at five and a half. It's come down to four. What I'm curious about, like all these Big Ten teams, I'm I'm very curious how they are going to fare in these bowl games because I don't know that their defensive numbers are reflective of what they are actually capable of on defense, right? And the reason I say that is I don't know that the offenses in the Big Ten were great. Uh, these are these are full season numbers. Let's look at the last six weeks, and I'll, I'll pull that up here. Uh, last six weeks, I would have Penn State favored by 6.72. Uh, the power rating has Penn State by like a touchdown. But Penn State by, you know, about seven points. Um, but you, you start to look at it, and they're number 29 in PPA per drive on offense, number 15 in PPA per drive on defense. Uh, just looking at PPA margin, how's that? Penn State, you got number 15, and Ole Miss, you got number 36. Um uh, what I'm curious about, so Penn State's strength of schedule is number 32. Ole Miss is number 6. Uh, Penn State played, like I guess Maryland was the closest thing to what Ole Miss is going to do. But even that was kind of whatever. Um, but when it when it comes down to it for Penn State, it's, you know, they played Rutgers and Michigan State. And they played Iowa earlier in the year. And they played, you know, just a, a bunch of offenses that – might not be able to compete in the Sun Belt. It's it's just they played Indiana and and nearly got beat in that game. So it's just it's just a mess. Um, when I, I I think I'm gonna have to go the direction that the line is moving on this one. Uh, I'm gonna take Ole Miss here, if for no other reason than it's four points, and I can see this being a field goal game. I don't I don't know that Ole Miss wins the game, but they certainly seem pretty motivated. Penn State losing one of their coaches. I, I'm very curious about that. Uh, this is just this is going to be an interesting game. I'm very curious which one of these shows up. Uh, but this is a fun coaching matchup, nonetheless. James Franklin, Lane Kiffin, uh, two coaches that their agents always have them on the short list for whatever job comes open. So always fun there. Uh, if you've not already, go on and, and like the video, 
subscribe to the channel for me. That would certainly help things out. And uh, tell your friends about the show. All that, all that good stuff. All right, carrying on. We have got the Music City Bowl. Auburn against Maryland. And right now, Auburn is a seven-point favorite with a total of 40... I put down 46.5. I think that's changed. Uh, let's see. Auburn and... Da, 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 da. There we go. Nope, still 46.5. It's only the spread that really moved. Uh, so 46.5 on that. Uh, it's 12... Sorry, sorry. It's 1 p.m. Central Time uh, on ABC on December 30th, on that Saturday. So, it's going to be a big Auburn contingent in Nashville. I expect a lot of Auburn fans for that one. Uh, looking at the full season numbers, I would have Maryland favored by four. Now, this is before uh, Talia Tungvaloa decided to opt out, so obviously that's going to change things. And that's why this line was sitting at Auburn minus two and a half forever. And as soon as uh, Tungvaloa decided that he's not going to play, that line went from two and a half to seven almost immediately, just across the board. So, um, seven seems like a lot of points for an Auburn team. However... You start diving through some of these numbers. I mean, this offense for Auburn is just atrocious. They can't throw the ball, uh, but I don't know that they're going to. I don't know that they're going to try to throw the ball, right? Like that's why would you do that when you know that Maryland's defense is number eighty-eight in rushing success allowed, number one seventeen in stuff rate, number uh, ninety-three in offensive line yards. Now, let's switch it over to the last six weeks, and over the last six weeks, I would have Auburn favored by. 6.71. Now, that's before Tungvalo goes out. Uh, the defense for Auburn picked up, you know, significantly here. And the offense, still not able to throw, but they were able to find... They're, they're number 62 in PPA per pass, uh, only number 128 in passing success rate. But they did find uh, some ways to score when they were throwing the ball, like once they'd get down into the red zone and whatnot. Um, their, their offensive red zone touchdown rate is number 34 in the country over the last six weeks. Like, they have figured out some things to do in the or in the, in the the red zone once they get down into scoring position. Um, I mean, look at it. Like, they're number 86 in scoring opportunities per game, so they only get inside the opponent's 40, like, five times a game. But, my God, when they get down there, Hugh Freeze really dials it up. He's number 53 in points per scoring opportunity. They're scoring at 4.2 points every time they get inside uh, the opponent's 40-yard line. Maryland's defense is number 109 in that metric. And so the Maryland defense against the run, number 87 in rushing success rate, uh, number 113 in stuff rate, number 84 in offensive line yards, like that's a problem. That's a problem. Uh, I'd, if, if Talia is sitting this one out, I'd, this, is kind of a, this is kind of the Syracuse situation, right? And we saw Syracuse just get walloped by South Florida 45 to nothing uh, because – this Maryland team is, they're talented, but they ain't that talented. And if you're not that talented, then if your quarterback says, hey, this game ain't worth it, then it kind of feels like the rest of the team is just going to kind of walk through it. So if I had to lean away, I, I think I'm going to go Auburn minus the seven here because Auburn, this is like a, a momentum builder for this team. So I expect Auburn to show up. I expect their fans to be loud. Uh, I think that Hugh Freeze wants to get a bowl win, and uh, and I believe he will do so. I think he will do so. The Orange Bowl, Georgia and Florida State, and holy mackerel, uh, what a bunch of opt-outs and whatnot for, for Florida State. Just nuts. Georgia has a bunch of guys in the portal, but it's a bunch of backups and whatnot. Uh, they're probably going to have some guys opt out, but they have not as of as of right now. Uh, Georgia is a 14 point favorite, or 14 and a half point favorite, excuse me, with a total of 44 and a half on it. Uh, this one's December 30th at 3 p.m. Central Time, of course, on ESPN. And let me go through the list. Uh, these are some of the players that Florida State will be without. This is per uh, Matt Zinnitz on December 21st. Jordan Travis, obviously, with the injury, so it's going to be Tate Rodemaker. Trey Benson, the running back, the wide receivers, Coleman and Wilson, the tight end, uh, Bell, the defensive lineman, uh, Verse and Lovett. And the linebacker, DJ Lundy, who's in the transfer portal. Whoa. Whoa. That's uh, that's rough. That's rough. All right. Let's pull it up. Let's take a look at the numbers. Full season numbers would have Florida State favored by six. 
if they had their full allotment of players. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with plays per game, um, success, like, or not success, but like PPA margin, stuff like that. Um, I, I want, sometimes I wonder about my model, you know? Let's look at the last six weeks. Last six weeks would have Florida State favored by just over three. It, it, we will never get to a point where Florida State is favored in this game, especially with the opt-outs, right? And even if Georgia has a bunch of dudes opt-out as well, it's not going to matter. So, uh, looking at this, the, there's no number that's going to matter here. The, the Florida State defense has shown to be elite, absolutely elite. They are number one in the country in defensive success rate allowed over the past six weeks. Number two in passing success. Number six in rushing success. Uh, Georgia's offense, like they have gotten pretty good at running the ball. Uh, certainly better once they got their running backs back and whatnot. Uh, their offensive line, pretty good. Number 37 in offensive line yards. Uh, the issue is Florida State's defense is number five. Uh, stuff rate, Florida State's defense is number four. Georgia, number 74. Like standard downs PPA, is Georgia going to be able to stay ahead of the chains? Who knows? Uh Florida State was number two in five factors plus talent rank, and Georgia was number six. But it, again, Florida State's going to have all these players out. I don't think that they care. I don't think their fans care. Typically, I would give Florida State a home field advantage for being in the Orange Bowl. I don't think they care. They got bigger fish to fry right now. They got bigger things going on. So, you know, I I think the only way you can go is Georgia, right? Like, I... It's a it, now. Here's the thing, it's a total in the 40s and a double digit spread that typically points you towards the underdog. But do you trust Tate Rodemaker against this defense? Um, do you do you think that Carson Beck isn't going to come out and just throw all over Florida State like that? I, I don't know. I'm going to take Georgia, uh, but like that just feels like a ton of points. And without knowing who's actually going to suit up for Florida State, I mean, it's it's impossible to to bet on the Knowles because, like, we've seen Georgia in this position. Uh, they thought that they were in back in, like, 2018 or whatever it was, and they go to the Sugar Bowl and just get blasted by Texas, who was not that good. Uh, now, I think that Georgia wants to continue winning. Like, they took their first loss in, like, 30 games against Alabama. I think they're still going to show up here. Like, this is not a deflating loss for Georgia. Florida State won every game and still were told that they weren't good enough, and now, like, none of their dudes are playing. So, give me Georgia minus the 14.5 on this. Uh, just wild. Absolutely wild. Let me tell you about saving some money on tickets. You see it on the screen right there. Ticket Smarter. Uh, these guys have everything that you could possibly want. Concert tickets, theater tickets, comedy tickets, or... Ball game tickets. And that's the key right there because getting into any of these games is going to be expensive. You want to take a last minute trip down to, down to New Orleans for the Sugar Bowl? I mean, it's going to cost you like 400 bucks a ticket to get in there because all the Longhorn fans. I know how you can save some money. You go to Ticket Smarter, you put in the promo codes WCE10 or WCE20. The WCE10 is going to get you $10 off an order of $100 or more. WCE20 is going to get you $20 off an order of $300 or more. Uh, you want to go see John ja Morant playing with the Grizzlies? It's going to be expensive. Faux show. Sure. Use one of them promo codes, WCE10 or WCE20. As always, think smarter, ticket smarter. We move ahead in the action and the Arizona Bowl, the Barstool Bowl, Toledo against Wyoming. Wyoming currently a four point favorite with a total of 44 and a half on this one. It is uh, December 30th at 3.30 p.m. Central Time on the CW. Or, of course, you can go to like barstool.tv in your app. Uh, not app, whatever it is. You guys know what it is. Hey, you, you guys know what I'm talking about. Go to Barstool's website. You can figure it out. Okay, let's look at numbers. Uh, Craig Bowl is retiring after this ballgame. The offensive coordinator is headed to North Dakota State to take over as the head coach there. Yeah, that's a that's a fairly big deal. 
fairly big deal. Uh, Toledo, full season numbers would have Toledo favored by 11.89. Uh, power rating would have Toledo by about 8 points. Um Toledo is the significantly more talented team, but their quarterback, Daquan Finn, is he's already transferred out. He is uh he is headed to uh Baylor. So backup quarterback against this Wyoming defense. Uh, very curious. Very, very curious. Let's look at the last six weeks. I think that's the biggest thing. How are these teams trending right now? I would have Toledo favored by ten. But uh but you start to look at this stuff, and it's like, okay, uh, I, the Wyoming offensive numbers ain't great. Toledo's defense, uh, Vic Karras, I believe, is the uh, defensive coordinator there. He is fantastic. Uh, Toledo is still just significantly more talented. But you want to talk about motivation for a bowl game? Wyoming is going to have significantly more fans there. Uh, they are going to be fired up because... They do love Craig Bowl, like what he did to build the foundation of that Wyoming program. Uh, yeah, like this is the numbers are not going to tell you that you need to take Wyoming. Uh, but I am here to tell you that absolutely I would take Wyoming. Uh, I would imagine Toledo is going to try and run the ball. That happens to be what Wyoming is best at defending. As far as the other side, Wyoming probably going to try and run the ball. Uh, they they have for the last six weeks over fifty five percent, or sorry, around fifty five percent of the time. Um, number seventy one in PPA per rush. Toledo's defense number fifty one. But Toledo's going to have dudes gone, like they're just they they are. Um, I I look at this. I mean, I, I'm going to tell you, Craig Bowl is retiring. I already bet this at Wyoming minus one. I, I still think that that's the way to go. Is Wyoming minus four? I think. Um, I mean, maybe this becomes a field goal game. I just don't know that Toledo wants to be here. Right? We've seen this in, in multiple games. Uh, I don't think Toledo wants to... Uh... Man, I said that about Fresno State, too, and I just look like a fool. Uh, so maybe maybe I don't go that harsh on it. But I will tell you, I think Wyoming is much more excited about this game than Toledo is. I think that's the best way for me to put it. So give me Wyoming minus the four, and I'll I'll feel okay about that. The ReliaQuest Bowl, Wisconsin and LSU. LSU, as it sits right now, a nine and a half point favorite with a total of 55 on it. This one is Monday, January the 1st, 11 a.m. Central Time on ESPN2. No Heisman Trophy winner in this one. Uh, Going to have multiple other guys sit out for LSU. The offensive coordinator, Mike Denbrock, he is gone to Notre Dame as of the time that I'm recording this. It actually broke this morning, so... Uh, again, I'm having to record like a week early, or almost a week early, uh, because holiday obligations, you guys know. So, this number's going to move a little bit. Pay attention to it. Total is 55 right now. I imagine that might go down with the offensive coordinator gone, with Jaden Daniels gone, with some of the other guys that are going to be out. Wisconsin is just a shell of itself. I, I think that some of these wide receivers for LSU are still going to play. I think LSU, here's the biggest thing. I'll, I'll pull up the numbers just so you can see them, All right? Uh, full season numbers would have LSU by 13.71. My power rating has LSU by 10. Um, what else have we got? Nope, here we go. Last six weeks it has LSU by 17 points. And this Wisconsin team has so many dudes out, just so many dudes out. Uh, it's kind of difficult. Braylon Allen is not going to play in this game. So this number 55 PPA per rush, number 37 rushing success rate, I don't think it's going to matter. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Because I do think that Wisconsin's got like some offensive linemen out as well. Uh, their defense probably still going to get scored on. Like uh, Luke Fickle is a good coach, but you can only do so much when you have a lesser roster, right? Like it's just the way it is. Wisconsin is, I think, eventually going to be good. But right now, eh, I don't think this is it. I don't think this is it. Uh, Brian Kelly consistently talks about the importance of being a 10-win program and how important that 10th win is. And you saw it last year. They went up against a depleted Purdue roster and just absolutely beat their brains in. 
like 63-7. to seven. They did not stop scoring. Garrett Nussmeyer? I know that Jaden Daniels won the Heisman. Garrett Nussmeyer is a good quarterback. Like, he's, he's still good. And with a month to prep, they are going to be able to do plenty with him. This defense, I don't expect to be as bad because the Wisconsin offense is not good. Uh, you start to look at points per play margin, uh, turnover margin, uh, red zone conversion, like all that kind of stuff. And it points LSU's way. But again, the players are going to be different, so these numbers may not matter as much. Uh, you can you can look at this number specifically. Number 85 PPA per drive on offense for Wisconsin. LSU on defense, number 131. It, there's not that much difference between those two. They're both kind of bottom half. Uh, LSU certainly bottom like three. But LSU's offense, number two PPA per drive. Uh, the Wisconsin defense, number 71. So that's, I, I think LSU is going to be able to put up points. And I think they're going to put up a lot of them. So I'm going to take LSU anything less than 10 here. Uh, even at 10, I would probably still lean LSU because I think that it means something to them. And so I think Brian Kelly uh, reinforces that quite a bit. He's a, he's a good coach. Just is. Just is. All right. The Citrus Bowl. Iowa against Tennessee. Tennessee is an 8.5-point favorite. The total is 36 in this game. Uh, just brutal. It's, uh, of course, New Year's Day at 12 p.m. Central on ABC. And, yes, uh, just a brutal, brutal game. Anything that Iowa is involved with is just, yeah, right? Full season numbers would have Tennessee favored by 9.7. The power rating has Tennessee by 11. Uh, You're not going to see a coaching matchup with two more different styles of coaching than what you've got with Kirk Ferentz and Josh Heupel. However, when you look at what these two teams have done towards the end of the season, uh, it's, it's still, it's relatively similar. Like the offense for Tennessee is still rolling. The defense has actually been bad over the last six weeks. Uh, but when you look at you know full season, Tennessee's defense, number 44. Uh, the Iowa defense is number one. This Iowa offense is just, ugh. I don't, I, how do you Iowa fans watch this? Like, it's, it is abysmal. Um, and yet, e- even I still watch it, right? I just, I'm not nearly as invested as you guys are. Uh, so this is the full season numbers again. Let's pull up the uh, the last six weeks. And give you an idea. The model says uh, Tennessee, even though they're number 41 in PPA margin, Iowa's number 66. I would have Iowa by 2.42. Now, again, this Iowa number, like over the last six weeks, they're number two in the country in PPA per drive. Uh, They did hold up pretty well against Michigan. But exactly what is it that they are defending? That's what I'm curious about. Uh, They're pretty good against the pass, but... I don't know. I, I just don't feel great about Iowa in any position, right? I think I don't think there's going to be a ton of opt-outs for uh, Iowa, but Tennessee's already had several guys out. Uh, Kirk Ferentz, really good against the spread in games like this. Uh, or in bowl games, for sure. And this number, I mean, eight and a half? Like, eight and a half is crazy. Uh, especially when over the past six weeks, I would have Iowa favored in the game. So you start to look at that. You look at, you know, what Iowa does on offense. Well, Tennessee's defense is pretty bad against the pass. They, they've just been kind of beaten up in some of these last few games. They are still pretty good at uh, stopping the run. Number 41, <clears throat> excuse me, in PPA per rush allowed. Uh, number 85 in rushing success rate allowed. Iowa runs the ball uh, over 57% of the time. You look at the five factors plus talent rank down here towards the bottom, and you got Tennessee 25, Iowa 26. I think eight and a half is kind of crazy when you when you really look into the numbers. Uh, Tennessee, not very disciplined. They're number 131 in penalties per game. Iowa is number five. Uh, when it comes to turnover margin, Tennessee doesn't really turn the ball over that much. Uh, they're number 15 in giveaways per game. I'm... I'm so curious on this. Uh, net explosiveness is is a huge thing. Iowa is not explosive on offense whatsoever. 
uh, you look at the numbers up there, um, they are number 115 in net explosiveness, number 133 in offensive explosiveness. But Tennessee, where they are explosive on offense over the past six weeks, number 31, uh, Iowa's defense is number 16 in defensive explosiveness allowed. So those kind of negate each other a little bit. Excuse me, I had to get some coffee. And yes, I'll just keep that in. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to take Iowa plus the eight and a half. Kirk Ferentz in a bowl game? Yes, 100%. Like it, I know the offense is terrible. I know. But they have a way of dragging teams down into the mud. And I think they're going to do it again here. I'll take Iowa plus the eight and a half. I don't know how much Tennessee is going to be amped up for this one, and I kind of expect more opt-outs from Tennessee. I don't think we're going to get as many from Iowa. So I expect Iowa to be somewhat full strength for this one. Uh, we got three more games we're going to hit. Go on and hit the like button for me, a little thumbs up button. You can see it right there. Uh, do me that favor. I would certainly appreciate it. And subscribe if you hadn't already. Uh, share this with your friends. Tell your friends about the show. I would certainly appreciate that. The Fiesta Bowl. The Liberty Flames and the Oregon Ducks. Oregon, as it sits right now, a 17-point favorite. Total of 67. This one's January 1st at 12 p.m. Central Time on ESPN. And let's pull up the full season numbers. I would have Oregon favored by 21 on the full season. Now, that is, of course, before opt-outs, before uh, there's been no coaching changes that I know of for Oregon, so that's good. Uh, Liberty, no coaching changes from what I understand, so that's good. Uh but there will be like a couple of backups and stuff here and there. Uh, Oregon, we we got to figure out whether or not Johnson and Franklin and all those guys are going to, uh, whether they're going to not play, right? I know that the center is not playing. I, I don't know if that makes a huge difference against Liberty. I mean, we'll see. This Liberty defense is just bleh. But we'll see. We will see. All right. So I've got Oregon favored by 21. This is going to be fun. Uh, Dan Lanning, to see whether or not he can get his guys motivated for a game like this. Uh, he's already gotten Bo Nix to commit to plan, and he's already got Bucky Irving committed to plan. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, as far as Liberty, Jamie Chadwell, like seeing his offense against that Dan Lanning defense, that's going to be fun. That's going to be fun. Uh, Liberty runs the ball. Uh, let's see. They run the ball nearly 70% of the time. And their quarterback, Caden Salter, it looks like he was built for this offense. I mean, he has been absolutely fantastic. These offensive numbers from Liberty, number three in PPA per drive, they are number three in offensive success rate, number three in rushing success, uh, and they move fast. They're number 28 in plays per game. Like, they are, and they're not, like, super explosive. They're number 94 in offensive explosiveness uh, on the full season. Let's look at the last six weeks. And now, last six weeks, I would have Oregon favored by... Uh, 15 and a half points, somewhere around there. My power rating has Oregon by 24. So, something to pay attention to, uh, which is way up there, and I know it's tiny, and I apologize. Uh, let's pull up the full, the full thing for you. So, Oregon's offense is also really good. They are number three in PP Ever Drive over the last six weeks. Liberty's offense is number one. The difference will be Oregon's defense, number 25, PP Ever Drive, Liberty's defense is number 67. You see these numbers. You see these numbers. Look at all the green on the Oregon side. Look at all the, the red and the orange on the Liberty side. Uh, points per scoring opportunity. Oregon is number four. Liberty's defense number 82. So Oregon's going to be able to finish drives. They, they just are. Uh, Liberty, are they going to be able to finish drives? They are number two in points per scoring opportunity. Oregon's defense is number 27. I mean, it's just a it's a huge, huge difference. Uh, you look at standard downs or standard down success. Liberty is number one in the country, and Oregon is number eleven on defense. Can Oregon find a way to slow them down on early downs? But even if you do that, you get uh, Liberty into passing down situations, and they're number six in the country at, at passing down success. So even if they get in in third and long situations, Oregon's defense is number sixty. In passing down success allowed. So I I still I think that this game is gonna really come down to who ends up playing for Oregon because I think that they could just overwhelm them with talent. Uh you look at the five factors, Oregon number three, Liberty number eighteen. But as it sits at seventeen right now, 
with who is playing as of today, Friday, December 22nd, I think I think I'm going to roll with Liberty as it sits. Because I think that there's going to be some more guys that opt out for Oregon. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Boy, this is this is a wild one. Uh, give me Liberty plus the 17 here. I, I, I like Jamie Chadwell. Maybe I'm a little bit biased. And I like Dan Lanning too. But, I mean, those longtime fans of this show know that Jamie Chadwell came on uh, during the 2020 season when there wasn't a whole lot going on other than, you know, when Coastal Carolina was doing their undefeated thing, uh, he came on when, with me on Winning Cures Everything, and we had a blast. So I'm a little bit biased there. Uh, we we just got to see who's playing. Like, that's the I think that's the same thing for all the bowl games. All right, let's do it. Let's talk about the CFP. The Rose Bowl. College football playoff semifinal number one, Alabama against Michigan. And Michigan, as it sits, a one and a half point favorite, total of 45. This one's January 1st, 4 p.m. Central Time on ESPN. And let's look at the numbers. Full season would have Michigan favored by 11 points. That's a pretty big deal, you would think. Uh, their offensive numbers, great, number 18, PPA per drive. Their defensive numbers, number two, PPA per drive. Uh, Alabama, number 30 and number 23, respectively. You look at PPA margin for the full season, and Michigan is number two. Alabama is number 19. Not a vintage full season Alabama team. But who, boy. Uh, You want to see a big difference? I mean, just uh, here are the five factors plus talent rank uh, for the full season. Alabama is number four, and Michigan is number one. Two teams that know how to play winning football. Period. But let's get to the last six weeks of the season. And all of a sudden, Alabama is ranked uh, number eight in PPA margin. Michigan is number 54. The Michigan offense completely fell off the map. And the defense is is still good, but not great. Right? Number 26 PPA uh, per play, or excuse me, PPA per drive margin. Uh, There's no margin there. Number 26 PPA per drive allowed on defense. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, The offense for Michigan, they only throw the ball 40% of the time. They're number 87 in PPA per pass. The Alabama defense, their secondary, uh, is going to have a massive advantage here. Like, just massive advantage against uh, J.J. McCarthy and that bunch. Uh, Because there are, I don't know that there are any real difference makers for Michigan on uh, on offense. I don't think they've got anybody that can extend uh, the field, right? So, uh, as far as PPA per rush, Michigan might be able to have some success there because you look at what this Alabama defense uh, has looked like against the run. Now, granted, these are the last six weeks, so when you look at these rushing numbers, you're looking at uh, Auburn with all of their motion and their delays and whatnot, and you were looking at LSU with their quarterback scrambles and whatnot with Jaden Daniels. So, those are certainly in there. Um Georgia did not have a lot of success. Michigan, they don't really do anything to disguise what they're trying to do. They just run it at you. Are they going to be able to do that against Alabama? That's the question. Uh, But if they try and pass the ball, uh, you ain't going to have a whole lot of success there. I mean, Alabama number 9, PPA per pass allowed. Uh, Michigan's offense number 87. When Alabama has the ball, this is where it's going to get interesting. Bama runs it 60% of the time as well, or close to. They're number 14 in PPA per rush. Uh, Michigan's defense is number 12. When it comes to offensive line yards, both of them are number 36 in those respective categories. Uh, When it comes to stuff rate, Michigan only number 75 in stuff rate over the past six weeks. Alabama number 37 in stuff rate allowed. You look at standard downs, uh, PPA, standard down success, Alabama number 9 in standard downs PPA, standard downs predicted points added. Michigan's defense number 49. So... Is Michigan going to be able to keep Alabama behind the chains? The numbers certainly don't bear it out. Uh, Over the last six weeks, five factors plus talent. Alabama's number one. Michigan is number seven. There has been a shift. Michigan has not been as good down the stretch, and Alabama has significantly gotten better. Uh, This one is fairly easy for me to call. 
I'm going to take Bama plus the one. I, I think they are better than Michigan right now. I know if you look at the full season and you see how much Michigan was dominating early, that's one thing. There was a shift somewhere uh, before the Penn State game even. They, they just don't look as good now as they did. And maybe they just thought, well, we can coast to the playoff. And once we get to the playoff, then we'll pick it back up. <sighs> Alabama already picked it up. I know they didn't look good against Auburn. They certainly did against Georgia. I'm going to take Bama. I don't think that uh, Michigan has seen a player like Jalen Milrow. I'm excited for this one. So give me the Tide plus the one and a half on that one. All right. Last game. Write down our times, of course. The Sugar Bowl. Texas and Washington. Texas currently a four-point favorite. Total of 63 and a half. This one, of course, New Year's Day, January 1st. 7.45 7.45 p.m. Eastern Time, excuse me, Central Time, God's Time Zone, on ESPN. And the numbers, full season, would have Texas favored by 3.6. At least my numbers would have them favored by 3.6. A score of somewhere around, you know, 32 to 28, uh, maybe 32 to 29, you know, something along those lines. Um, my power rating would have Texas by 3.13. Um, and for those asking, the where it says Washington... that's like Washington plus, plus three. So you get the, you get the idea. And I just realized I don't have the Washington graphic up here, but I've got it on the next one. Yes, I do. Okay. So full season numbers, uh, both of these teams are good. Washington number 15 in PPA margin, Texas number 17, you know, uh, both pretty good. Washington, bigger split, obviously number eight in PPA uh, per drive on offense and number 74 on defense, Texas, a little bit more even, 27 on offense, number 17 on defense. Uh, these two teams are just pretty strong against each other when it comes to Washington's offense. It, they're better at passing than Texas is at defending when you look at the full season. Now, on offense, Washington actually pretty decent at stopping the pass, even though teams have thrown the ball on them nearly 60% of the time. Uh, but, you know, again, it, can Quinn Ewers hit the deep bomb? Can they, you know... You guys know what's up. You guys know what's up. Let's look at the last six weeks. And on the last six weeks, I would have Texas favored by 6.02. Here's the thing about this Texas defense, right? Oklahoma State and Texas Tech were not able to exploit them in the passing game. But they are number 88 over the past six weeks in pass success rate allowed. Washington is number 29 in that metric. Uh, Washington, not super explosive in the past game over the past six weeks. Um, But Texas, not really going to be able to get havoc against that offensive line. Uh, Washington, number five in havoc allowed. Uh, Texas, number eight in havoc created. Um, That's the... I'm I'm so curious about that matchup. I'm just very, very curious. as far as running the ball, like Dylan Johnson has been just a godsend for this Huskies offense, but I don't see them having a ton of success against Texas's defense. Now, we said that about the Oregon game as well. So, it is what it is. I let's let's get down here to five factors plus talent. Washington is number 12. Texas is number 8. And that's kind of where I I decide which direction I'm going to go, right? Other than the fact that uh, this game is over a field goal. Kalen DeBoer is like, he he is a mega coach. I, I just, I, I don't know, I don't know the best way to go about quantifying how important Kalen DeBoer is. Uh, the guy just wins games. And every time he's been an underdog at Washington, he has won. They beat this Texas team last year. So even though these numbers don't show you that they should be able to win this game, he's an incredible coach. So you look at defensive success rate for Washington, number 116. Well, they they certainly showed up against Oregon, right? Uh, They showed up in every game that they needed to show up in. They just find ways to win games. And now you're going to get a very healthy Michael Penix after a month off you're in a dome, like with Roma Dunze and, and that bunch, McMillan. 
that that Texas secondary ain't great. I'll certainly tell you that. So, I I think I I expect Texas to win the game, but four points feels like it might be too much here. Um, I could see this being a field goal either way. I'm going to take Washington plus the four, uh, but I still fully expect to see Texas and Alabama in the national championship game. All right, uh, let's recap it. Let's recap it. That way you you know what to follow along with. I certainly appreciate you guys. Uh, appreciate you guys for being here. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'm taking Clemson minus the five, Notre Dame minus six and a half, Memphis plus 10, Ohio State plus one, Ole Miss plus four. I will take Auburn minus seven, Georgia minus 14 and a half, uh, LSU minus nine and a half, Iowa plus eight and a half. Uh, did I say Wyoming? Wyoming minus four. Uh, Liberty plus 17, Alabama plus one and a half, and Washington plus the four. Go and watch the Bet US College Football Show. We will be here for the national championship game. Uh, on, uh, excuse, yeah, yeah, we're previewing the national championship game, I believe January 2nd or January 3rd. Keep an eye out on the channel for that. There's a link in the description, so make sure that you are subscribed there. Subscribe here as well if you're not already. Uh, go ahead and like the video, tell your friends, all that stuff. Leave some comments. Uh, I want to keep the conversation going. Let me know what you expect to happen in these games. And with that said, I hope you've all had a Merry Christmas. I hope you all have a Happy New Year. Uh, we will... Start up with the news and rumors and all that kind of mess again. Going to be a lot of fun next year. I'm going to try out some different things. Uh, see if we can get on a better schedule now that uh, now that the baby is here. And, you know, we get through Christmas, all the holidays, all that kind of stuff. But uh, we're going to schedule out some things. Definitely leave in the comments what you would like to see for the new year. With that said, take care of yourself. Take care of each other. God bless college football. And hopefully, hopefully, all of your tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. If you want to toss in a question, you can email me, Gary, at winningcureseverything.com. Make sure and hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.